In this video, I will share with you how to do bidirectional communication with process VIs and how to use reentrant clones. In the first part, I shared some of the basic principles with launching dynamic process VIs. If you haven't seen that video, I suggest you stop watching this video and go back to part 1, VI Shots video episode 3. Otherwise, you may have a hard time following some of the concepts in this video. In part 2 of this two part series regarding using dynamic process VIs, I'll get into more details of how you can do communication more effectively with your process VI from your main VI. Uh, in part one, we saw how we could write to the front panel of a dynamic process VI using the set control value uh, method. That's a pretty crude method. Here, I'll show you how to use queues. Let's take a look at an example that uses queues for communicating from the main VI to the process VI. Now, if you're not familiar with queues, don't worry, they're not that difficult to learn. We'll go through them together step by step. Basically, a queue is like a deck of cards, where you're placing cards on top of the deck and removing cards from the bottom of the deck. The sender puts cards on top of the deck, and the receiver pulls the cards off the bottom. The deck has a certain size, and you can control that size, or you can have an unlimited size. Let's take a look at some of the queue functions. In order to in initialize the queue, you have to use this obtain queue function. A queue can be any data type. In this example, we're using an enum data. We're using an enum data type with three elements in it. We call these commands. We have a start command, a stop command, and an exit process command. So we initialize the queue. And at this point, we can actually specify the, uh, the size of the queue. Right now, we'll leave it as unlimited. Here, towards the right, we have three buttons that effectively issue these three commands. They issue the start command, the stop command, and the exit process command. To send a message, what we do is we enqueue a message on the queue. If you, can look, if you look at the icon, you'll see that we're putting messages at the back of the queue. And in, the, in the, the recipient side, we'll be taking messages off the front of the queue. The code here on the left is similar to the code that we saw in our previous example. We open a VI reference, we run the VI, and in this case, we set auto dispose to true, so we don't want to manage the, the VI reference. We'll let LabVIEW auto dispose the reference. And we also use the control value set method only for writing the queue reference, so that whatever queue we initialized here, that reference to the same queue, we pass it to the dynamic VI, and then that dynamic VI actually uses that queue reference to actually pull messages off the queue. Let's take a look at this dynamic VI. So here's the queue reference that we actually wrote to from the main VI, and here this function waits for messages on the queue. It pulls messages off the queue, in this case, it's the icon is showing us that we're pulling messages off the front of the queue. And then we're taking that data value and executing or doing something with it. Now, it's important to note that this function has a timeout action. So if we wire a timeout value here, in our case, 100 milliseconds, then if no message is received within that 100, 100 millisecond time frame, this loop will iterate again and come back and wait again. If no message is received, it'll iterate again. It'll do that until we get an exit process command. In this case, it'll stop the loop. Or if we somehow release the queue or destroy it, then an error message will come on this wire and it will also stop the loop. Now notice here, we also don't have a front panel open method. We actually control that. So this VI executes when we execute the run VI method, but its front panel will only open when we actually send the start command. Uh, you don't have to have the front panel open at all. This process VI can run without its front panel. Now notice that we don't have a start process. Why? Because the actual process is started by executing the run VI method. That is what starts the process. So if we wanted to start restart the process, we would have to execute the run VI method again. So let's see this in action. Run the main UI. And let's open the VI tree 
so that we can see. Sorry, let's open the VI hierarchy so that we can see this um, in action. Okay, I'll bring it down here. So now we'll run the process VI. You'll see that it came into memory. The process VI is running. We'll execute the start work, which will open the front panel. We'll execute the stop work, which will close the front panel. And then we'll exit the process. And exit process actually stops the VI. And because we have auto dispose reference set to true in the run VI method, the VI leaves memory completely because the VI reference is auto disposed. In this example, we'll be doing something pretty cool. We'll be launching a process VI multiple times. The same process VI will be able to execute it multiple times because we actually will be executing a re-entrant process VI. Let's take a look at how the example runs. This is showing a situation where you need to download multiple files from somewhere in parallel. You enter the file name to download, and then you hit Start Process. What this does, it'll open a VI, which will actually have a progress bar, and it'll download the file you told it. If we change the file name and hit Start Process, another process VI will start. We can keep doing this, and yet another process VI will start. When the da download has completed, the VI will automatically leave memory. Or we can abort the actual download. In the meantime, while these downloads are occurring, this main UI keeps track of the percentage complete of each download process. In addition to this, we can actually send messages to these individual VIs. So let's say if we want to send a message here, um, which one was that? <laughs> we can say send message. Oh, it was actually this one. Send message. And it'll get send message. And the message will get sent. Okay, so the diagram looks pretty complicated, right? No worries, we'll go through this step by step and we'll figure everything out. The trick to getting this functioning, we need to have a re-entrant VI. And when we open the VI reference, we need to open it with a special parameter. Now this special parameter is wired into the options input of the OpenVI reference. And we have to wire a 08 hex value. What this means, that what this does, it tells the OpenVI reference that we are actually opening a re-entrant VI, so allocate a separate memory space for this VI and prepare the VI for re-entrant run. The second thing we need to do is go into the re-entrant VI and set that to be re-entrant. In order to do that, we have to go into the execution properties and enable this checkbox, re-entrant execution. So now that we have a re-entrant process VI, every time we click on the Start Process VI button and open a VI reference, we are actually opening a reference to a brand new instance of that same VI. What this allows us to do is it allows us to have a single VI and open it multiple times. One thing that we would like to do with these VIs is to be able to communicate with them and be able to receive information from them. In order to communicate with the process VIs, we use queues, as we saw in the previous example. The trick that we're doing in this example is instead of uh, obtaining a queue and sending the queue reference to each process VI instance, we actually use a feature of the queue called obtain queue by name. Let's take a look at this. The obtain queue by default, creates an unnamed queue. But if we actually wire in a name for this queue, 
we can actually assign it a name, and then if we perform an obtain queue somewhere else, anywhere in LabVIEW, and we wire the same string input or the same queue name, LabVIEW will actually look up, do a lookup to see if a queue with that same name exists, and it'll, and it'll open a reference to that queue. The nice thing about this is it allows us to have a parallel process VI, open a queue, uh, do an obtain queue by name, and if we're using the same name in the main UI or the main VI, then we're basically talking to the same queue. I'm using that trick in, the com in a combination of another trick, which is um, instead of generating my own name for the queue, I actually use the name of the reentrant process VI. So that's what this property is doing here. After, after I obtain a VI reference, I get the name of the reentrant process using the clone name property, and I use that as my queue name. Now, within that process VI, I actually do the same. Get the clone name and do an obtain queue by name. So let's, let's probe this and see what this name looks like. So if I run this VI and then click on start process, you'll see that the clone name is equal to the process VI name, colon, and then the instance. If I run this again, you'll see now the name is colon two, colon three, colon four, etc. So I will actually get a unique name every time I run the process VI, which is cool. And I can use this as my queue name. And inside the process VI, I can use the same name. Let's jump quickly to the process VI. Now there is some code in here that simulates the downloading of a file. No file is actually downloaded, but this is just a simulation. And that's what this code in here does. So we can ignore that. So here on the bottom left, you'll see that we have the function to wait, wait for messages from the queue. And here's where we're actually using the clone name of this process VI to actually obtain a queue. So this name and the, the name that we used in the main UI is actually the same. Now, when it receives messages from the main UI, it actually takes this message, which in this case, it's a string. In the previous example, we had an enum with various commands. In this case, we're using a string. This allows for maximum flexibility, although there is no type checking, meaning that it's possible that we can have typos introduced very easily. So we need to do some error handling to make sure no typos get passed through. But it gives us the maximum flexibility. And we actually use a separator to separate a command with the, uh, the data for that command. We have several commands here. We have a message, if we want to pass a message from the, an arbitrary text message from the main UI. We have the exit command, which stops this VI. And we have the file name command, where we can pass the file name to this VI. Let's go back to the main UI. Now, in addition to sending messages to the dynamic process, we also want to receive messages from the dynamic process VI. This is something different from the previous example where we had a one-way communication. In order to receive messages, the main UI or the main VI here needs to have its own receiving queue. And this is where it happens down here. We obtain a queue. We do this by name as well. We call this queue main UI. This one also waits for messages from the queue. So if it gets a message from the process VI, it'll actually process these messages. And the messages right now that we've set up to receive are the percentage complete. So whenever uh, the process VI updates the percentage complete of its download, it'll pass it back to the main VI. And this simply updates a list on the front panel of its percentage. Now let's go back to the process VI. On the process VI side, at the very top, we actually obtain a queue by name, and we also call it main UI. So it's pretty safe to create, it's, so it's pretty safe to use the word main UI as long as we standardize on that and we say that all our process VIs, if they obtain a queue by name called main UI, 
they will be passing data back to the main UI. Here we do things like process started, send a command back to the main UI that the process has started. Over here, while it's being downloaded, we send back process with percentage complete. Here we're sending messages on, we're putting messages on the queue. And finally, when the process is stopped, we're sending a message back saying, hey, the process has stopped. Notice here that we're doing a release queue as well. We have to do a release queue every time we have an obtain queue. So whenever you do an obtain queue, you have to make sure that you follow it up at the end with a release queue. Otherwise, you leave this queue resource in memory and it uses up uh, memory space. Let's go back to the main VI. So here, we're handling the messages. For example, process stopped. And if the process has stopped, it actually removes it from the list. If the process has start, started, it adds it to the list. And progress updates the progress percentage. Here is how we send a message to the process. And what we're sending here is just uh, arbitrary text. So we're getting the, we have to select the process on the front panel from the list. We have to actually highlight the item here. And then the highlighted item, the item name gets indexed. And then that is the queue that we obtain. We send a message on the queue and then we release the queue. Finally, in the main VI, after we stop the program, we get a list of all running processes because, you know, the, the user could at any time click on the stop main program button while these process VIs are still downloading. So they click on the stop main program, we need to make sure that we stop all those processes. So what we do is we look at all the list of running processes, obtain queues, send an exit command, and then release the queue. There is some code that needs further explaining up here, and this is the special release queue references. So what we're doing here is we're actually um, obtaining a queue, and we're actually sending a message onto the queue. We're putting a message on the queue. However, we're actually putting a message on the queue before the actual VI has started executing. So if we put a message on the queue and the recipient, there is no recipient to receive the message and we don't keep the queue reference live or active in memory, then that queue message will get lost because the queue will actually get released. So what we're trying to do here with this shift register is we're keeping the queue reference live in memory for as long as we need to so that the message stays on the queue so that when someone starts waiting for that message, it'll get it. So this is one way that we can actually put a message on the queue and have it wait there so if the recipient can receive it right as a first message once it starts. So as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of code involved with the communication process. And this can be cleaned up quite a bit by creating sub-VIs, uh, creating reusable code modules, and uh, you can clean this up quite a bit. However, we, I decided not to create sub-VIs and put everything flat on the diagram because this is demonstration code and I wanted to make it easy to show you the process of launching the process and uh, communicating with it. Thank you for watching the second part of this two-part series. Remember that all the code shown is available for download on the VI Shots website. Hopefully this tutorial was helpful and gave you some ideas that you can use in your own LabVIEW software development. Bye for now.